Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Benedikt Greller from the uh, Institute for Geoinformatics from the University of Münster. Um, but simply call me Ben if you have any questions. And uh, please, during the talk, uh, whenever I'm going too fast, too slow, uh, you have any questions on details, whatever, please ask directly so we can try to figure it out immediately. Um, so first class today is on spatial temporal cridging. Uh, but as spatial temporal is an obvious extension of spatial cridging, we will start with a kind of basics first, and uh, there's going to be more quick wrap up of uh, spatial, simple spatial cridging and uh, different cridging techniques, brief introduction to uh, the variogram again, and then we kind of will move rather soon to the spatial temporal extension of it. Who is uh, familiar with the Pure spatial geostatistics, variogram estimation, variogram models, bridging covariance matrices. Okay, so I might spend a few more minutes than I thought earlier on it. Um, kind of just of the common understanding and common basis uh, for spatial data, we're kind of always relying on Tobler's so called first law of geography uh, that states everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And this is the basic idea of all the spatial statistics that we do. So kind of, uh, we look at our data set from a purely statistical point of view, I would say I have a variable I'm looking at and I have co-variables and these co-variables are simply the coordinates. And now I would like to make sense out of the coordinates based on distance, based on location. So that's how I kind of move from the normal statistics to spatial statistics whenever, whenever I use coordinates as my co-variables. And um, we'll, of course, assume a similar idea for the spatial temporal case, where you say kind of temperature today is closely related to the temperature tomorrow, but might not so closely be related to the temperature next week. So kind of things happening closely in time are stronger correlated than things happening with a longer time period in between. And um, once you start to do your spatial statistics, you also have to care about coordinate reference systems and projections because kind of what you want to do is to, you want to measure distances in your data set between locations. And uh, these distances might vary strongly depending on the coordinate reference system and the projection you are using. So typically we like to think in, in meters on a flat surface to describe our dependencies, but naturally we kind of record our coordinates on the globe as latitude longitude. And we kind of all know that since we have a different rating at the equator than we have close to the poles. So just as an illustrative example, if you think of the fjord of Oslo here in Norway and the city of Uppsala in Sweden, uh, they're both at the same latitude approximately, and they have like about seven degrees uh, in longitude difference. This makes a great circle distance, so we really take off um, trying to draw circle through these two cities, the center in the center of the Earth, then we get a great circle distance of almost 400 kilometers, which makes a rate of 56 meters per degree. Um, if we do the same thing at the equator, the Congo River crosses the equator twice, so that's a nice example to look at. Uh, the distance in degrees is a bit more than seven, the great circle distance is a bit more than 800 kilometers, so 111 kilometers per degree. So just kind of to uh, give you a small wake up, small warning. Please care about your coordinate reference systems and the projections that you're using when you start to model spatial data and looking for distances. Because you can really, if the process has the same distance across, uh, kind of in terms of kilometers, then you might get different results for here, Congo, and uh, the difference between Fjord of Oslo and Uppsala. Yep. Uh, it's kind of <clears throat> a uh, sine, cosine function. You have this angle relationship. So if you kind of just take it from the, uh, cut the globe from the north to the south pole, and you look at the section, and you can look at the angle, and this angle tells you how, the kind of, how it changes the relationship. And it goes up to kind of uh, zero at the poles, obviously. So you have kind of at the center, very center, you have zero. And kind of the maximum is at the equator of 111 kilometers per degree. So it's kind of That's true. North house is the same, but east-west is a problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, and these are all East uh, West examples, sure. Yeah. And uh, typically, your coordinate reference system comes as a coordinate reference system identifier as an EPSG code or a project for string that should be somewhere in the metadata of your data set that you're looking at. And if you have a, made it a spatial points data frame in R, uh, you have a slot where the place is for the coordinate reference system. And once you have kind of provided the correct identified coordinate reference system, you are able to kind of to transform between different projections, reference systems, and so on. It's important if you kind of start to combine different data sets that come from different sources using different datums different projections, then you have to kind of combine them in a useful manner. But uh, I believe Edsa talked about SP transform that would kind of do this job for you if you have the right information. I think of the, the problem from the projection, so why don't we kind of wrap up the Earth on, on a nice flat surface, is always that we want to kind of start on a surface in three-dimensional space, which is kind of, uh, kind of curved, and we can't just make it flat. So every, every time we make it flat, we get a distortion in the data, in the coordinates. So we have to kind of find good local approximations to make these distortions to our data to kind of be able to work on metric coordinates, which are just kind of on very precise lines, only exact, and just everything gets a bit more approximate. So if you work on a global scale, uh, I'd suggest to kind of look at great circle distances. So really what is the length of the arc spanning the globe between two locations and kind of to calculate distances. Just a simple example you might know, uh, we can see kind of same world we're living in, but kind of different projections, but kind of the shape of a country's changes. And uh, well, the same happens to your metric in the background that you're using to calculate distances. Uh, so this talk is based around fields spatial, spatial temporal random fields. So we always assume that the process that we are modeling is something continuous. So like temperature in a room, we assume that kind of the, if we measure the temperature continuously from here to the door, there's a continuous change in temperature. So there aren't any gaps, any jumps in it. And we assume this process spreads continuously over space and over time, and that we can observe it in generally at any point. So we can move anywhere we like and just kind of measure the temperature, but typically we only do it as a discrete set of points in space and time. And uh, typically we have a few spatial locations, but a very kind of uh, high frequency measurements in time where we're looking at. Uh, in the spatial case, this is a standard example you probably have seen earlier this week. Uh, the MERS data set with its zinc concentrations in the ground made from sound, uh, sound, sound, soil samples and just kind of what we are looking at, what we are like kind of targeting at, is how does this process look like in the whole area? So just like if you look at temperatures, that we measure a couple of stations in Europe, we would like to know what is the temperature all over Europe. So we want to like to get from those single point measurements to surface of our viable. Uh, things we typically assume there for is stationarity. So it means the process looks the same everywhere. So we assume the kind of mean and variance doesn't change for the simplest assumptions. So it doesn't matter if we, um, if we have just a single station and put it in, some, in, in Oslo and Bergen, and we look only at the single station, we suppose it looks the same, which is probably not true, especially if you talk about temperatures in Europe. They will uh, defer, so we have to do some pre-processing to make your process look a bit more stationary. But kind of the first stationary assumption is it doesn't matter where we are, at every location, the process looks the same and behaves the same. And uh, a second thing we typically assume is isotropy. Uh, that means if we look at pairs of locations, it doesn't matter in which direction we kind of look, it's just kind of the distance between these locations. So it doesn't matter if the locations are north south to each other or east west, if they're 10 kilometers apart, uh, the correlation between these two locations is the same. <clears throat> um, these are very strong assumptions. If you think of large-scale processes that you would like to model, um, but they're kind of techniques to weaken these assumptions. You could kind of, uh, for the stationarity assumption, could build an underlying model first and then kind of look at the residuals of your spatial, spatial temporal random fields 
and the residuals are typically a bit closer to stationarity and to isotropy. So um, there are a few techniques to get along those uh, assumptions. And kind of isotropy, there's the possibility to kind of to rescale your coordinates a little bit. So if the correlation along north south is, is much stronger than east-west, you can kind of make the distances east-west smaller to appear as strong as the north-south distances. That's kind of one way to get along with isotropy. But kind of for the first simple assumption, we assume we have a stationary isotropy random field. Um, so we would like to describe how the dependence changes with distance. That's where we start to look at variograms. <coughs> um, so we kind of, for a certain distance h that we have here, we would like to estimate the kind of uh, square difference between the location, any location s and any location that is kind of h apart from s. So s here is any location, h is kind of another location, h kilometers, meters apart from s. And uh, this is kind of the theoretical definition and as we're working with data and would like to estimate theoretical variogram models, we have to start with some empirical estimator to kind of to get an idea how the variography in our data set looks like. And kind of here's what we do to kind of get an impression of it. We build distance classes, these uh, NH or neighborhoods of certain sizes, and kind of these are all pairs of locations uh, that are from single, they're not further apart from each other than H plus a certain uh, epsilon. So kind of, just kind of look at all possible combinations of pairs of locations. And when you start to split them in groups, with distances between zero and 20 kilometers, 20, 40, 40, 60, 60, 80 kilometers. And put all pairs of location that kind of fit into such a group in this group. And then for this group, we calculate the empirical variogram of the single group. So we kind of, um, because we don't have uh, typically many repetitions of an exact distance between two locations, we have to make those distance groups, those lack classes, where we can look at distances approximately. So kind of take a bit of variability around the distance we're looking at and then kind of uh, summarize over them. And then it's only a sum that we have to take of the squared differences and we weight it by the number of uh, locations that are in this distance class, in this leg class. That's how it looked like for the Moist data set. Um, so we have the distance on the x-axis and the variogram, the gamma value on the uh, y-axis. And if you would kind of imagine vertical lines here between the points, then these kind of bins would mark the bins you have used to calculate the variogram. So your distance classes that you have been looking at. And what we would like to find now is kind of a function that nicely uh, fits these kind of scattered points, and this is then kind of the variogram function that we assume to describe the dependence over space in our data set. So what can we see from this plot? Uh, it seems to stabilize at a certain value. That's kind of the joint sill, that's how it's called, um, which is kind of the overall uh, variability in your data set. And uh, the point where it stabilizes is called the range. And the range is assumed to be the point where the spatial correlation drops. So kind of for very close points, we have a very strong correlation because they're very close to each other. And then kind of the strength of correlation drops slowly. And, and the range it kind of drops completely to zero. So for points further apart than this distance of the range, we assume the correlation between the two locations is zero. And there's a problem, so-called small-scale variability. So even if we, one problem is that we don't have any observations very, very close to each other. So typically we have a minimum distance between two locations where we measure. And there's kind of some uh, underlying process that we don't completely understand that we can't model, so we kind of get a small nugget effect. So it's kind of some noise on top of the data that we can't explain. And the nugget effect uh, is here where the kind of assumed line that goes through these points hits the y-axis. So this kind of this value is the nugget of our um, variogram model. Then we have the range and we have the sill. So these are kind of these three typical parameters you have to fit for a variogram to describe it as a function. 
and then you can choose between different Vagram models. Uh, the kind of are slightly different curves, slightly different shaped, that will describe your dependence. Sorry, yeah. Just repeat those three variables, like only one range and Nugget and SIL. Nugget is the uh, kind of smallest y value where you hit the y axis, mm -hmm. and the SIL, the overall SIL, is kind of the, um, the value where it stabilizes. Yeah, I, I would kind of go for 800 meters, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, kind of we will fit a model in the next slides, and then we kind of see how, how it changes. Um, kind of the overall goal of this diagram is to parameterize the covariance metrics that you would like to use for the critching predictor. So this covariance metrics has to fulfill certain uh, probabilities. It's symmetric. It uh, needs to be positive semi-definite to be invertible and kind of to build a nicely shaped Gaussian distribution. Uh, so we stick to certain family of well-defined diagrams. So you can't fit just any curve you would like to have to these points. Uh, you have to rely on diagram models that are kind of well-defined and proven to give a valid covariance metrics. And if you just call in R VGM, then you get kind of a list of all variogram models that kind of VGM is short for variogram models. And here I just put head around it to get the first six entries. So nugget is kind of, you can have a pure nugget effect. Then your data set is purely noise, no spatial correlation at all. And then they're kind of typical ones, exponential, spherical, Gaussian distribution. Uh, Materian class is very flexible, but hard to estimate. That's the first parameter. That's a bit of trouble to estimate. And then in R, you kind of get a fitting function to fit a variogram model. So it's fit.variogram. Uh, you provide the empirical variogram, so just kind of the point cloud that we saw earlier. Uh, and just kind of, you provide these points. And uh, there's kind of, as well recorded in this empirical variogram structure in R, you get the number of points per lag class, average distances, and some more information to make the fit happen and you provide a variogram model. So you have to decide which one of these models you would like to have fitted. So it's the fit variogram function doesn't decide it for you. So you have to provide a prototypical implementation of the model. Yes? Um, could you um, interpret the SIL as the total variance? Yeah, the SIL can be interpreted as total variance, yeah. And... Um, yeah, you have to provide kind of a model that you would like to optimize. So what you kind of optimize are those three parameters here. And it's uh, the um, partial sill of the spatial effect, the range of the model, 1,000 meters here, and kind of the nugget effect, the sill of the nugget. And the partial sill of the model and the partial sill of the nugget together give the joint sill of the full model. So. It, it's sometimes uh, the notions for sill, partial sill, and joint sill, they're not so clearly well defined. They sometimes get a little bit mixed up. But kind of I stick to the R G stud world here. And so it's a partial sill that you get per model. So uh, fitting a nugget and a spherical model here is already kind of a combination of two models of the pure noise effect plus something spatially. And each of these models has a partial sill, so its own contribution to the overall sill. And uh, the nugget obviously has a range of zero. And the spherical model is here is estimated to 830 meters approximately. And here a few more. Um, the green one, yeah, it should be visible. The green line is the uh, exponential model that's fitted. The blue one is a spherical model, and the red line is a linear model. So just kind of to give a first idea how those models, uh, kind of how well they fit the points and, and how are the difference between these models. They're kind of not too different here, but you kind of uh, will have to select the best fitting one of these. Yeah. Does the uh, empirical variogram depend on the, how we make the bins and the, how we the, the blocks? Yeah. 
um, the question was how the uh, empirical diagram depends on the binning, and yes, it does depend on the binning, and kind of this is a typical trait of that you have to look for, you have to have enough points per bin to have a sensible uh, estimator, and you would like to have many bins to have a flexible model. So it's kind of, it, it depends on your data size, how many data points you have to look at, and um, typically you should kind of try slightly different bins, number of bins, and maybe places of bins, and once you get to kind of combination of parameters where it doesn't change a lot, then you're kind of in a good range. Uh, yeah, but it's kind of, um, it's more or less a histogram on distances. And typically what you would do with a histogram is a histogram on measured values. But the binning is not based on measured values, it's based on distances between points. But in general you have the same problem as for histograms that you would have many, would like many different bars that describe your distribution very smoothly. But on the other side you need a certain amount of points to get a good idea of what you would like to fit. Uh, that's kind of the stationarity assumption. For the stationarity assumption, we assume the process looks the same everywhere. And uh, based on the stationarity assumption, we can say, well, this diagram describes the process everywhere. But of course, in reality, you will have processes that are not stationary. And then you have to kind of uh, try to look at zoning, fit a diagram for every <laughs> continent separately, for instance, or for, for certain uh, climatic zones that kind of might explain more what you're looking at than taking a global model. So this is always based on the assumption the process looks the same everywhere, the dependent structure looks the same everywhere. But you can kind of, um, if you kind of have a model that explains some of the variability before, it doesn't even have to be a spatial model, it can just be a regression model, and you then start to look on the re uh, residuals. And these residuals are often closer to stationarity and isotropy. So this might be like a two-step model. First, you model the regression from uh, useful parameters you have on temperature, like elevation, for instance. So you could kind of first model temperatures based on elevation, and then look in the residuals, and the residuals can then be passed on uh, to Pidgin. Does this answer your question? Good. Uh, once we have defined our Viagram model, we have a kind of prioritization for the full covariance metrics and are ready to do quidging on this data set. Uh, the covariance matrix is kind of, if we have 200 measurements of the process we are looking at, then the covariance matrix is kind of a 200 by 200 matrix that we look at, and uh, this gives us 200 dimensional Gaussian distribution. And this distribution has some very nice features based on uh, metrics, algebra, that kind of can give us predictions for locations where we haven't made any observations. And kind of this huge matrix can then be parameterized only by those three parameters, nugget, sill, and range. And of course, driven by distance and the diagram model. So we can fill up this large, this huge matrix just by calculating the distance between those points and fill in the diagram value but it's not actually a variogram value. What you fill in the covariance matrix is the overall variance of our random field minus the variogram. So kind of we flip this function around. Um, so kind of if we subtract the variogram from the overall variability, so we start here and now the function decreases to zero for a certain distance and then stays zero <coughs> afterwards. So we get a huge matrix, and this huge matrix can now very easily be calculated and uh, can then be inverted, multiplied to some tricks. And then we get an estimate for the points that we would like to have a prediction value for. Uh, 
And this is just simply how it looks in R. You simply call the function creech that does the creeching for you. Uh, you say what you would like to creech, so it's zinc concentrations from the Moise data set, it's the left plot, to the Moise grid, that's the right-hand side plot, and you provide the model that you would like to use. So you provide the variogram model and kind of calculating the covariance metrics, applying the inversion and prediction step, it's all done behind the scenes, and what you get is kind of a new spatial pixels data frame with the predicted values all over the grid. And here for the prediction step, we don't not only look at the, co the covariance metrics between observed locations, but we build a covariance metrics between all observed locations and all locations we'd like to predict. But we can, with the same principle, we can fill up this covariance matrix um, based on the distances we have from the uh, distances between points fed into the variogram model and then providing us with a weighting scheme to do the predictions at unobserved locations. And what you get like an extra on top is a creeching variance that gives you a first idea of the uncertainty in your model, um, kind of how uncertain the model is about the prediction. So what you, the predicted value you get for every grid cell, for every pixel you see in the plot before, uh, is the mean value of the conditional distribution. So kind of for every pixel you build a conditional distribution based on all observations I have made and this conditional distribution is again a Gaussian distribution, and the predicted value is just the mean value of this distribution, and kind of the second parameter, the variance, can calculate it as well. And so kind of, you could imagine for every pixel you get, you kind of can put a Gaussian distribution around this pixel. And uh, this variance for each of these Gaussian distributions per pixel is depicted in this plot, it's the Kriging variance, and kind of a property of the Kriging variance is that it depends only on the distribution of points. So it's completely determined by the distance between points. That's where you can see the lowest variability for um, the measurement points. These are all the dark blue, almost black spots here. That's really resampling the locations where we have made observations, and the highest uncertainty is in the areas where we lacking observations. Uh, no, they're kind of at the location, at the exact same location, we have perfect knowledge. So there we have zero variability. And once we kind of start to move from this, we kind of have increasing variability. But kind of, if you have two measurements pretty close to each other, then it's kind of low variability in between. But if you get further apart from all other measurements, then it's kind of increasing. Yeah, it doesn't depend on the observed value, so you have the same variability no matter if it's a very small value that's not dangerous for your studies, so to say, and a very large value, you always get the same variability just based on the distance between different locations. Good point. Well, typically uh, your target grid is predefined. So uh, you have somebody saying, I need a resolution of 100 meters per pixel. And then you kind of put a grid and do the predictions. But um, of course, we started on from point support. And now we kind of plot it as pixels. But the predicted value is, again, only kind of a point support. So this is some kind of where uh, it's not very precise, really, to kind of to, to plot pixels, really, but kind of we assume that the pixel size is small enough that we can assume that this single point we predicted represents this pixel rather well. So you have a tendency to go for a smaller pixel size. If there are smaller pixel sizes are more accurate than the larger ones? Uh, they kind of accurate in terms of point of support, mm -hmm. but of course uh, your prediction doesn't get better only because pixels are smaller. This is kind of, it's, um, 
so kind of what you really get for the predictions are measurement at points, well, in this kind of sound se uh, soil samples. So kind of you don't measure at a point, so what you measure is kind of, I don't know, so some few cubic centimeters, maybe a cubic meter even, and kind of you kind of try to dissolute the heavy metals and get an average out of it, so the support is a bit larger. But of course, the pixel is still much larger than the support you have been starting from. So it's just kind of plotting a continuous map, in this case, is more a metaphor, therefore, that I assume it's closely. And um, if you would kind of imagine the predicted values, um, like it's, it's really continuous, you kind of you get a continuous curve as well. So it could have could draw connections between those single pixels. And then kind of it disappears in the color scale at some point. So it's, but it's all kind of trying to get out of this trap. But yeah, you're right. It, it, it's a change of support. Yeah. It's as well the prediction itself, yeah. So uh, this, the Quijin prediction is kind of completely based on the Gaussian distribution, and your observations should look like something Gaussian. So that's kind of a problem often. Uh, as well for the zinc concentrations, they don't look Gaussian really, they might be log Gaussian. And then you can do some transformation first to the prediction on the transform scale and then transform back. But this kind of gets you extra terms on the uh, back transformation. Because what you kind of, uh, you're predicting the median value. So if you're predicting on the transformed scale, you're predicting the median value, not the mean value. And due to the skewness of the distribution, if it's non-Gaussian symmetric, uh, you get some problems in the variance and the back transformation. So it's not anymore the uh, best linear unbiased estimator as a probabilistic, uh, as probability theory tells us, and it kind of it changes to something not as good, but kind of still best thing you could do if you have to use Quijing, if you have to rely on the Gaussian distribution. I'm not completely sure, but I would say both. Um, yeah, but it's kind of the, the uh, least squares optimization happens on the transformed scale. And on the transformed scale, everything is fine. On the transformed scale, it's, it's still the blue estimator. But if you transform it back, you're kind of in trouble. In trouble in terms of having blue estimator, but you still get an estimate, of course, for your point. And maybe just going back to the quitting variance, uh, if you look at those point samples, we have this kind of white spot here where you don't have any points. And if you kind of move oh, just one slide over to here, we have this yellow spot here, so high variability. And uh, we don't have any points low here and no one here, only a yellow one that kind of almost disappears. So there are two white spots and these kind of appear again here. So it's really the quitting variance uh, kind of illustrate your sample density over the study area. Um, as you might know, there are different quidging types already in the only spatial application. Um, this is simple quidging where you assume a mean value is known for some reason. Um, ordinary quidging is what we just did in the slides before. It's just kind of we only use the coordinates that kind of tell us about distance and dependencies. Um, universal quidging, we use additional regressors as distance to the river elevation. So we kind of build a more complex model. And what's sometimes helpful is code quidging, um, where you as well look at cross diagrams between different variables. So if you look at zinc and lead, um, we could kind of look at the cross diagram between zinc and lead, when we start to want to predict zinc, we kind of have to take into account the lead value, and the zinc value is assumed to kind of be somewhat correlated with the lead value, and then we can, can improve our prediction. This is especially helpful if you have kind of two variables that are strongly correlated, and one is kind of very easy to sample, where you have many observations, and the other one is a bit harder to sample, where you have only few observations. 
we can use this cross variograms, this cross dependency between variables to kind of to improve your prediction so you can use the kind of cheap measurement you get as a first proxy kind of and based on this proxy you can then predict the value that you would like to look at. So it's very helpful if you have kind of varying uh, numbers of samples and would like to use a very large number of one variable to predict the other one. Uh, kind of for regression creating, you would do regression first and creature the residuals, and for the universal case, you would kind of you estimate both at the same time. Does it matter? Does it change the outcome? Um, it does slightly, <laughs> but it's it's typically not a huge difference. So kind of then you only have simple linear models that you can kind of combine, but the kind of advantage is that you can optimize all parameters in the same least squares estimation of parameters. Yeah, so it's kind of <coughs> nice single black box you can use instead of having two boxes you have to put together. Yeah. Any spatial question at this point before I move on to spatial temporal? Um, I thought of doing exercise kind of in the afternoon and having theory in the morning. If you, kind of, if you prefer to have kind of uh, exercises, kind of, I have two blocks of theory and then I would have kind of one block of application afterwards. We can make it kind of split it and say we have one block of theory first, block of application, and then again next block of theory. But kind of uh, these slides I think will last until the coffee break and then we kind of can decide if you would have a hands-on first or if you would like to continue a theory. So we can just kind of, there will be hands-on, but kind of, we ha can still decide whether, where to place it. Uh, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Um, so what I've been talking about is, is point quidging. And uh, there is, good uh, to remind me, uh, block creaking as a possibility where I really kind of start from point measurements and would like to estimate full blocks. So based on country boundaries or on, on really large grid cells. And um, there's kind of nice theory that kind of lets you do it in one step and kind of shows you how the creaking variance per block has to be calculated. And kind of the Underlying idea is that you kind of predict many, many, many points in the block you would like to predict. So for the whole study area for, for a large pixel cell or for the full area of a certain country, and then kind of take the average of it. And kind of if this number of points becomes very, very large, you can kind of uh, have a theoretical result that tells you how the covariance looks like. So you don't have to predict all those many points. So you really can do it in one step and kind of the advantage is that you reduce the variability. So if you want to kind of, if you're trying to predict points from points, and it's kind of this is the finest level you can get, but if you want to predict areas, lettuce in some sense, from points, you kind of can average out a large deal of variability. Because kind of, if you think of the uh, way you would go there by sampling many points in the polygon that you would like to predict, and then taking the average, this averaging takes out a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. And this happens as well if you kind of use a closed form for block creaging approach. So if you kind of need values on a block, then it's really helpful if you can do it and um, you kind of get better estimates, you get more certain about the value. That's kind of just a natural assumption. It's easier to estimate the mean value of a country than kind of the precise value at a certain spot in space. That's why block creaging is helpful in many cases. Uh, 
Uh, it, can, it works on both scales, so you can just kind of do it on a pixel basis. So if you're going from single points to two to two, four to four hundred meters or whatever, then you kind of can use it to kind of get a better idea of the value of the pixel, really, and not just of a point that represents the pixel. But you can as well go to boundaries of counties, countries. Okay, um, space time. So space is denoted S, time is denoted T. Uh, what a mathematician would do is just take space and time and put it together and we have three dimensions and it's happy to go. Um, this works as a data structure. So we can, we can easily describe our data as space times T. But when we start to model our process, we have to think a bit more careful about time and kind of special properties of time. So one problem is direction, so kind of Today's value kind of influence tomorrow, but it doesn't have any influence on yesterday's value. Of course, yesterday values has influenced the value of today, but this is always the same direction. So we don't have the symmetry as we would have in space. So in space, we always say if the temperature in Bergen is related to the one in Oslo, it's the other way around. But this is not true in space in, in time. So that's one thing you should keep in mind when you start modeling and, and start to uh, predict spatial temporal data. And another problem is on isotropy between space and time. So what does it mean if I move one kilometer in space and one day in time? How, how are these distances related to each other? And kind of what we would like to end up with again is kind of a virogram that describes how the correlation changes over distance in space and time. And therefore, depending on the model, we have to decide how does space relate to time? So that kind of spatial distance a spatial distance unit and the temporal distance unit kind of have the same influence on the change of strength of correlation um, in this setting. So there where we look for an anisotropy scaling for space to time. Um, the easiest way kind of to think of it is just time slices. So kind of like uh, take a satellite image uh, once a month and you kind of put them all on top of each other and then kind of get a space-time cube. Um, or you have kind of continuous time series like daily values at several locations so we kind of get a time slice for every day. But if you just think of slices, you just kind of forget about the dependencies over time. So you can still model slice-wise the spatial dependency, but you can't model the interaction and the cross correlations if you move in space and in time between points. So that's what you would like to do if you kind of would do real spatial temporal modeling. We'd really like to look at all distances and the influence of these different combinations of distances on the uh, correlation and the strength of correlation. And kind of a first proxy to spatial temporal approaches, um, as I mentioned, slice wise. So um, we do the interpolation for every slice and fitting a very gram model for each time slice. So this is just like having a series of spatial fields that you look at, but you don't have a model of a spatial temporal field. Uh, there's the idea of having a pooled virogram, so you use all the data you have, but you estimate a single spatial virogram, and then use this single spatial virogram for every time slice. So kind of this is just kind of increasing the amount of data. Or you could do something evolving, or kind of uh, where you um, fit a spatial virogram for the first time slices, and then kind of the actual fit of the day you're currently looking at depends on the previous fitted ones. So just like the parameters change over time slightly uh, based on estimates per time slice. And what's kind of typically helpful here is what, what you see if you look at uh, the time series of those data sets that the variability from one time set to the other time set changes. So kind of the overall sill will change. But kind of you could assume that the ratio between nugget and sill, so kind of the amount of noise in the data and the amount of explained variability in the data is always the same. So if you only have kind of half variability in your data set, you just kind of reduce nugget and sill to the half to describe it. But if you kind of use only a constant variogram for all time slices, you would kind of assume that the, the overall variance is the same over time. But with the evolving approach, you can kind of mimic slightly changing overall variability. It's just kind of pre-processing or pre-investigation steps. If you look at your data set, you could kind of 
look into these approaches to see if they uh, are helpful already. But now really moving to the spatial-temporal case, uh, where we now assume we have a spatial-temporal random field, so it's not only defined on a single location in space, so we always need space and time. And um, we still stick to an isotropy and to, uh, to an isotropic stationary field, keeping in mind there's a problem with spatial-temporal anisotropy between kilometers and days. And the extension is a very natural one, so we look at uh, points of locations that have a certain distance in space, h, and a certain distance in time, u, to each other, and take again kind of the expected value of the squared differences. And the empirical version follows the same idea as a, a spatial empirical version, so we build again lag classes, but these lag classes are now not only across space, but also across time. So kind of if we look at all points we have, calculate the distances over space and over time of all those point pairs, uh, we have to kind of fill in them into a grid of bins. So we have kind of a spatial dimension and a temporal dimension and kind of fill in many, many bins here and have to kind of put point pairs into these bins depending on the approximate distance they fall in. And then we can sum over the square differences and uh, weight by the number of point pairs per bin in this kind of grid on the floor. Uh, here's an example scenario. We're looking into particular matter, uh, less than 10 micrometers, nanometers, nanometers in diameter. Um, they kind of recorded at many, many stations all over Europe, and what they report are daily mean values, so the daily mean concentration of particular matter in the air. And these are just kind of 10 days from June 2009. Um, sorry, here we are. And you might see that kind of uh, these first two days are pretty calm, nothing happening, then something seems to kind of build up and then dissolutes again to the uh, southeast, maybe, but this kind of seems to be in the data. And what we'd like to know now is really how to kind of have this continuum in space and time looks like. So we would again would like to go from single points to surfaces or kind of to, to space time cube where we have for every point in space and time uh, we have a measurement. So this is again the Kijing idea going from single points to something continuous. Um, we can kind of calculate the empirical diagram mm -hmm. in GSTAT. Um, as a warning, it takes somewhat more time because typically you have much more data if you have spatial temporal. So if you have 200 locations, but you measure it for a full year, you suddenly have 365 temporal slides of it. So kind of the data size grows. And uh, because we have to make binning in space and time, this kind of takes a bit longer. And uh, so what you provide to it is what you would like to estimate the variogram of. So here's the variable name PM10. Uh, Gear June is, are the values, Germany over June. And we have a temporal lag. This is kind of the lag between days that we look at. So zero is kind of stays in the same day, one, two, three to four days. So these kind of blocks and days that we're looking at. And we set a cutoff, a spatial cutoff at 500 kilometers. So we don't look at pairs of locations that are further apart than 500 kilometers. Um, well, here does some rescaling for distances that shouldn't have ended up in the slides to do the plot of a wireframe. And this is then the empirical spatial temporal variogram that we're getting. So for the pure spatial case, we kind of would only look at these endpoints of these lines here and would end up again with this kind of few dots over space. But this we have now kind of for every time lag. So we have a spatial variogram in some sense for zero day separation, for one day separation, for two day separation. And this makes up this mesh, this wire plot we can look at. Uh, the structure is in some sense similar that we start somewhere close to zero here. Of course, we don't have repeated measurements at the same location at the same time point. So that's why this value 
this very first value is missing, just as we don't have observations for a pure spatial case for zero distance of separation. So we simply don't have repeated measurements because there's only one world where we can look at at the same space, at the same point in space and time. Um, but we, of course, now have, for one day of separation, we have observation at the same point in space. So that's, that's why we kind of get observations here for zero spatial distance, but distance in time. So just kind of looking along the time series at all the points. And um, the same here over space. So now we have zero distance in space, but distance in time where we can look at. And kind of we start here somewhere near to zero, where we kind of would assume some nugget effect and something that we could explain with distances over space and time. And when we move into space, into time, kind of the variability, the, the variogram increases and the strength of dependence decreases. And kind of if you move in both directions, going somewhere here in the surface, kind of it increases in, in both directions. So what we would now need to do is kind of we have to fit a surface based on some model to this surface. So we're just again looking now for a Viagram model, but it's not any longer a single line. Now it's a surface that you would like to fit another surface. Um, we have kind of... Sorry, just could yeah. you go back to the diagram? Because I'm still struggling like, with, the, with the interpretation. I mean, is there, is there a general cutoff level for gamma where you say there is no spatial correlation? Or, I mean, um, kind of the, you mean the point where it stabilizes, kind yeah, of? Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. The, uh, I would say the, the value where it stabilizes is something around 15 here. Mm -hmm. And kind of, well, days, maybe three days, and distance 250 kilometers, 300 maybe. It, it's hard to say from, from the figure on its own. Mm -hmm. um, you typically have to kind of look into the models that you fit and kind of look into different models that you're fitting to get a sensible idea of it. Um, kind of different way to plot this is, is kind of uh, this uh, heat map where you see very low values, dark, bluish uh, colors down here, and going up into the bright yellow colors for high values up here. So you kind of, it's just kind of a matter of taste what you prefer to, to look at your data, if you like this wireframe, three-dimensional thing, or if you just say, I stay in the plane, it's a two-dimensional level plot. As so we would like to fit a model that's, again, capable of generating the covariance uh, matrix and the covariance structure that we would like to look at, uh, we have to stick to certain models that have proven to provide uh, valid covariance structures. And these are metric, separable products, and some metric. Well, there are more, there are others, but these are the ones that you can find in GSTAT and they give a first uh, idea of what's useful and we will kind of go through them. Um, so we're still kind of up to fitting a sur uh, model surface to the empirical model. Yeah, please. And was this actually the pooled the approach that you mentioned, the slice approach, the 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 try to do it slice-wise and try to do it only spatially but using all the spatial temporal data. And this is now really to kind of to get an idea of the spatial temporal process. So really kind of the continuous process over time as well. Not slice-wise, but kind of looking at the continuous cube of possible values. So the pooled approach is still the slices? The pooled approach is still the slices. Yeah. You use all the data to fit your model, but the interpolation is done on every slice only. And kind of if you uh, kind of back on this almost spatial temporal approaches with the uh, slice wise pooled and so on, uh, there your variogram is still only a line. So that's kind of still only one direction you're looking at. And if you into move into true spatial temporal distances, then you get the surface uh, in space and time. Um, metric quidging is kind of the next simplest approach where you assume there's a certain scaling between space and time. Say we can 
adapt like uh, one day to 150 kilometers and simply scale time to this spatial dimension. And then we assume distances between space and time behave just the same. And that's a metric model. So it's just kind of the Varagram model down here uses just a distance. That's kind of the Pythagoras distance uh, of the spatial distance and the rescale kappa is our isotropy value like days per kilometer uh, times the distance in days. And this gives us a distance that looks purely spatial. So here we kind of assume a kind of process that behaves over space and time the same way, only that it kind of needs a temporal rescaling. Just like if you would have measured values uh, in the surface at different depth level, you typically have to rescale depth levels to get to sensible uh, scaling that kind of aligns with horizontal distances. Um, kind of, we try to follow the notion of the kind of spatial cases. So we have to again provide a potential model first. So we define a metric model that we would like to optimate, uh, optimize in the fitting strategies. And we here say it's a metric model. And the metric model has only a joint variogram, so the same variogram for space and time. And these variograms here can again be any variogram that we have seen from the spatial case. So you get a huge degree of, well, an additional degree of freedom that gives you a huge number of possible combinations of uh, models. So good for one thing you have to choose is how you combine space and time, metric separable product sum, and so on. And then is the second question is what kind of models do you stick into this combination technique. So the different spatial temporal models is just how to combine space and time. And then you have to kind of provide a, again a variogram model uh, that really explains how this combination uh, is carried out. Um, so here we choose the exponential model uh, as a joint. And we set a spatial temporal and isotropy value to 100, which means 100 kilometer per day. But these are just kind of the first estimates before you can fit it. And um, kind of as fitting surfaces isn't as easy as fitting just kind of single functions through it. Uh, we rely on kind of multi-parameter optimization in the background. And uh, you have the possibility to kind of provide uh, tuning parameters to the optimization technique. What's typically helpful is to kind of provide lower values. So the optimizes, optimizing process it's optimized the function from R in the background and provide parameters that tell us don't use values smaller than a certain value because then you kind of get all kind of strange effects in your variogram model and you kind of assume that you have at least here uh, 10 kilometer as a spatial distance and you don't use temporal distance below zero, of course. So they can kind of provide some parameters to the fitting algorithm in the background, uh, helping you to get a better estimate of it. And of course, it's, it's hard to judge which model fits best. So you kind of would like to have some, some number to stick to. And uh, what you get as well for the spatial model, about, uh, but as well here for the spatial temporal one, is really kind of um, the uh, square differences between the surface and the empirical points. So that's kind of a value you could rely to if you would like to judge which model fits the process better. But of course, if you just kind of would compare uh, wireframes or level plots of empirical variograms and your model variogram, and you find certain properties that you would like to preserve in your data set due to expert knowledge, uh, you're of course free to choose a model that doesn't have the best mean squared error, but kind of fulfills other properties that you would like to preserve. It's not necessarily the case if you kind of optimize your variogram model and then do cross-validation on your data set, it's not necessarily the case that the best variogram produces the best cross-validation. So it, it's the best method you have right now to fit a, val a valid model, but it still doesn't mean that it's the best value on cross-validation. It's just kind of different ways to look at your data set and to validate your model uh, at different points kind of in the modeling steps. So the fitting routine now has kind of optimized the parameters of our uh, prototypical variogram that we provided. 
And now, of course, we would like to plot it again, and this works the same way as it does for spatial cases. We provide the empirical variogram first, and then the fitted variogram to the plotting function, and uh, get a nice color map out of it, where we can see how the metric variogram would represent the empirical variogram on the left-hand side. Uh, typical for the metric case is that you get this kind of uh, ellipsis of uh, increasing variability, uh, increasing variograms. Um, but kind of, it's the first idea, but kind of if you compare the spatial distances for larger temporal distances, this seems to be a mismatch. It's pretty much okay kind of for zero temporal distances, but it kind of is different here. And now for the model, uh, we have this zero, zero value down here, the very dark bluish one. Uh, this is kind of the nugget, the estimated nugget effect that we have. And in this model, it's kind of an overall nugget effect. Uh, we will see models where we have nugget effects that are different for space and for time. So kind of have different nuggets over the temporal and over the spatial dimension. And then you can do the critical prediction. I think the code is here. Uh, so there's an extension to the critch function. It's critch. ST, uh, but looks otherwise pretty much the same. You tell the function what you would like to predict, PM10 again. Uh, the data set you're looking at, Germany June, and you provide a target, grid. So this is just kind of a grid over Germany, Germany gridded, and kind of the temporal time steps you would like to look at. And you provide, of course, the fitted Valgram model, the metric fit. Yes, please. Uh, one is kind of um, constant, meaning in this case you only look at the uh, coordinates, but you could as well uh, provide your covariates. So if your data set has zinc and lead, you can kind of zinc depending on lead and coordinates. Then you kind of would do the universal quidging, the new linear model on it, and then doing the quidging on residuals. So you can pass a linear model over this function argument uh, into the quidging predictor. Um, okay, next approach is uh, separable covariance models. There we assume we have a spatial process, a spatial covariance structure, and we have a temporal covariance structure, and simply kind of multiply them together. So we don't have any interactions over space and time. We just assume that the spatial temporal cross correlations are the product of the space and time correlations. Uh, so in terms of covariance matrices, it's simply the product. In terms of the variogram, it looks slightly different. But what you fit here is a spatial model and a temporal model, and then you kind of combine them uh, afterwards again. And now again, the number of parameters increases. So for the metric model, we have the three parameters for the variogram that we use, for the simple uh, spatial variogram that we reuse, and then isotopy. So we have four parameters. But here now we have um, a joint sill over the process, a joint nugget. And for space and time, we have kind of a range of it. So we define it again here. So we say it's a separable model, it's had a spatial, co spatial component, space, and the temporal component time, which now are kind of two different variograms. And here now we can choose all kinds of combinations as well. So we can combine exp exponential with an exponential model, spherical with an exponential, both spherical, and all kinds of combinations of possible variograms, trying to find the variogram that best describes uh, our spatial temporal process. And we can then kind of start the fitting routine uh, that tries to optimize these parameters here. And when we look at the optimized value, we get a slightly smaller value. Uh, we had one point something earlier for the metric model, now it's 0 0.8, so we seem to be closer with this separable variogram model to the empirical variogram model. And we can do as well plotting the same way and do the predictions. And here we can look at both, both models that we have fitted. And what you can see, they kind of do a bit better here. So we have kind of a different pattern than in the metric case. And kind of this 
increase is kind of a bit more similar to this one here. But kind of this one up here is still not as good as it could be. And kind of the pure spatial case seems to be a bit more too, too stretched. Kind of the sample has a slightly different pattern here than we see in the separable model. And kind of a new interpolated surface that you get. Um, what what kind of the quitting variance error or what kind of uh, yeah you get the quitting variance as well so you can I don't have the slides here but yeah you get it from the quitting routine you get the prediction and the variance and you can plot it as well and just kind of uh, this day fifteen here and and the plot earlier is now kind of really the prediction of the full month June. So you take all the data you have for June, all spatial locations you have, and predict a single time slice for day 15. And of course, you can predict all the other days as well. So this is kind of real, using all the data from the space-time cube to predict the single slice in between. That's why you see in this map kind of stronger deviations between like this, the colors in the squares are the observed values at this location, but kind of it's based on the history in space and time and the strength of dependence, uh, the model says, well, this isn't so bad as it appears at this single station. The overall picture seems a bit, a bit better, a bit lower. Yeah, please. It's, it's completely true. It's really just uh, the points are very sparse given that this process of particular matter, mat matter is kind of a very local one. Mm -hmm. But kind of uh, it's, this is the official data you get and this is, they ask for maps so we have to do maps and it's kind okay. of, but you're completely right, yeah. Okay. And it's kind of, uh, could uh, take it as a reminder that you really kind of don't trust the maps you get, kind of think about what, what has happened to get this map and kind of uh, who might be responsible for it. In terms of modeling, uh, the next complicated step uh, is kind of the product sum model. They kind of have spatial temporal component and the product of both, so we have a bit more of spatial temporal interaction here. Um, we have a set of new parameters to make sure this is a valid covariance function um, with certain conditions, and these parameters can be kind of uh, traced back to SIL over space and time. So there is some algebra behind it and uh, some uh, parameter training. So we kind of, again, back to our diagram model that's kind of written out here with a nugget spatial component and a temporal component. And uh, different than for a separable model, we have kind of a single joint sill, but here we can have different sills for space and time, giving us yet more parameters. Um, here we run into problems with a fitting routine, kind of just to be honest, uh, kind of rescale the distance here to get better fitting results, and then we have to backscale it again. But this is mostly uh, I'd say for numerical issues. So it's kind of, we're trying to fit a surface of, uh, I think it's eight parameters here. So kind of you get an all kind of trouble if you would like to optimize eight parameters at the same time. And kind of here we provide the spatial component in a space, the temporal component is time, and we can again choose all kind of combinations between exponential, spherical, and all the, the long list of possible values. Um, do the fitting again, look at the attribute of the uh, optim output here and see it's kind of again a bit smaller, well, it's a more complex model so we hope to get a bit better fit uh, well, a bit closer fit to say we look at the plot again and here's the product sum interestingly um, it kind of 
squeezes the increase to a smaller range here and kind of is constant for the larger distances, um, which might be true here as well. And this kind of what you see in, in difference here is just kind of some noise you get based on the sampling you have, based on the leg classes you build. So you, the points will always be a bit more scattered than you can model with a, with a uh, product sum model that you adopt. And we get yet another quiched map. Um, and in this model, the point, the local point here, suddenly has again a bit more influence. So maybe this might be the better model to really describe the process as the other ones before. So all kind of the first shot, they very look all in, all the same. So it's it's hard to tell, well, which map should I trust? But there are differences uh, in what you really get if you compare them very closely. And I believe they are all on the same. Yeah, they are all on the same color scale. So if you kind of look through them, they are all the same size. Um, product sum. Yet more complicated, more flexible, more parameters. Uh, it's a symmetric covariance model where you have a spatial component, a temporal component, and a joint component. Uh, the joint component is assumed to be a metric one, so we kind of add up different models here. Uh, so we need, this, again, the spatial temporal anisotropy to describe the joint component of the model. Uh, this nicely translates into a variogram of a symmetric model, and now we have to fit a spatial temporal and joint variograms here. Again, this kind of dirty rescaling trick to get optimized working. Um, we say it's a sum metric model. We have now space, time, and joint for the metric case. Uh, here we choose all as exponential, but of course you can do all kinds of combinations here, uh, which kind of gets a new degree of freedom of possible combinations and uh, work to, to inspect those models, which one might be the best for the data set. And we have to pass the spatial temporal and isotropy. Earlier we had 100, but now it's only 10 because we rescaled our distances. That's why we switch from 100 to 10 here. Um, called the fitting routine, provide again a set of lower boundaries that we don't want to undershoot. Uh, look at the squared error, it's again a bit smaller, so we hope to be again a bit more closer to the sample bar. Just ask, why did you rescale the, 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 the distances? <laughs> uh, kind of. This makes the spatial distances a bit more closer to the temporal distances, and that's why the optimization is a bit more robust than if you have like thousands of meters and in a few days, then kind of uh, the optimized routine tries to kind of change a set of parameters at the same rate, but if you have very different data provided, then the same rate might have a very different effect, and then it's hard for the optimized routine to really to get to the point to a good estimate. But this kind of could probably be optimized within the uh, creating routine so that you kind of try to automatically rescale distances to something meaningful temporal uh, to make it easier for the user, but it's kind of still an early development stage, the spatial temporal component in GSTAT that is still kind of on the slides to, to kind of show you some workarounds to, to get a better fit maybe. Mm. Yeah, here we're back to the sum metric, um, which has this component of having kind of scaled everything a bit more closer to the smaller distances of the increase, but is not as constant as the other one, uh, as the preceding product sum model, and so there's still some increase on the right-hand side of the model. And what's different here from the previous models is that you have kind of uh, the pure temporal one kind of has considerably lower values then for a first distance step. So kind of you have an increase, uh, you have a nugget effect different on time than on space. And again, you get a map with slightly different contours and different colors fit the areas better or less good. But you could as well take this as a technique to find outliers. So you take the spatial temporal model, um, try to predict the values you would like to look at and then kind of compare the values you've got with a predicted one, and just kind of uh, to find points where you might think of are there outliers or are there kind of really very low, very high values at this time point. 
but it seems to be unlikely that kind of if the whole process here is predicted around 15 and this point is measured somewhere around 8, I guess, <coughs> that it is really the, the true point here. But kind of, um, if you think of how these measurement stations work, they kind of really uh, filters that kind of soak in the air uh, for a certain volume and then really measure the amount, the, the weight of the particles you get. Uh, that kind of all kind of local effects you might take into account that might be a problem. Placement of the stations is a problem. There have been studies on the small scale variability uh, where they measure directly at the road and two meters next to it and they have considerably different values. So kind of modeling this on a global scale, on a, global, on a European scale, uh, it's really just kind of best guess. It's, uh, there's much more behind the process and much more variability than you can explain. Here are all different variogram models in a, a wireframe plot. So you can kind of pass to the plot function a list of models, and then the plot function will just kind of plot all the models next to each other, either as wireframe or as level plots, um, just kind of to better compare them next to each other. And I've just kind of, for the symmetric model, I've uh, stressed this point that you have kind of this special nugget in time and space. And this can you very, very well see here in, in the wireframe plots, a very steep increase uh, still for larger temporal distance here over space, which is not the case for the metric model. It's kind of, there aren't any steep increases anymore for larger temporal distances over space. But this kind of, this most steep increase here, this that there is still some increase, is visible in the, separate, in the empirical and the sample diagram as well. So these seem to be really better fits to the sample than the metric one, the first shot we had. Can I sure. How, based on your experience, mm -hmm. right, how would you summarize the main criteria that one should base his decision of uh, model selection? Um, Kind of, I would, if I kind of look into different models, say metric, separate products, and submetric, I would kind of rely on the um, kind of on the root mean squared error between sample and surface to select if it's exponential, spherical, kind of to do all those rotations, and once kind of come up with the best model that describes the sample diagram for each of these possible metric separate combination classes, I will then look at the surfaces to decide which surface is most closely to what I assume is in the process. And um, of course you can kind of reason from the other side from, the, from your knowledge of the process. So if you know that, the, or if you're kind of pretty sure that it, it's a separable model, then you kind of just stick to the separable one. But kind of has underlying assumptions that are kind of at times hard to fulfill. Same for the metric model, that you assume that kind of the only difference between space and time is the uh, kind of the measurement unit of space and time that I rescale. Then you kind of get this metric model. So if you have a good reason based on the knowledge of the process, how it works to decide for a certain uh, model, then I would kind of use this one and otherwise kind of iterate over possible combinations of exponential spherical Martian classes to find the best one per class and then look into the surfaces which one describes it. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and here we get, kind of, we start off with the 10 days of uh, observed values and here are the 10 days of interpolated values. Um, we kind of have again very calm first days then something builds up here and then kind of dissolutes to the uh, southeast as a kind of interpretation. Um, so we ask uh, for block cridging in the spatial case. You can as well do block cridging here. And kind of what was motivated uh, by the European Environmental Agency, they, uh, in their reports, they have to provide an annual mean value of PM10 concentrations. So we were wondering if it might be useful to do block cridging over time. So what they do now, they kind of uh, calculate mean values per station and then interpolate a yearly map of a mean value per station. But we'd like to make, make daily values and then take the mean of all days. <clears throat> and to do it slightly different was to do block feeding. So we took like 
uh, temporal columns out of it and kind of try to predict what is the mean value of this temporal column. So for every pixel cell, we, tried, we, we used a block that's kind of the pixel on the ground and kind of a pixel on the last day and use this column of, of temporal pixels. And uh, you have the same effect that you can reduce variability if you do it this wise. And you kind of uh, get mean concentrations over the year that are considerably lo uh, lower than kind of what we've seen for the single days in June. And uh, you get the different variants. And here the variance isn't anymore only dependent on the measurement locations. So you get some other artifacts here. So while there is here an observation, the variance is still a bit larger than where we have uh, even no observation here. Because it's now based on all the observations there are. And if you have kind of missing values at some time points, you might kind of make up for it and get a slightly different uh, variance. And especially it's very much smaller than the variability you have for predicting a single day, which is again natural. It's way easier to predict the annual mean value than the precise value at a certain day. And here's just for comparison, the increasing variance for a certain day, the day 15 again, which we currently looked at, um, going up to values almost at 20. And here it's kind of not even 1.6, so it's more than 10 times larger on a daily basis. Um, while well, for block creaging uh, in time, you still have to kind of do a workaround in, in GSTAR, so it's not natively implemented. Uh, it's just kind of more or less for completeness. And uh, I think my last slide for the coffee break, um, you could as well do local spatial temporal creaging, which makes very much sense uh, because you hardly have the computational power to invert this huge matrices of 200 locations across 300 days a year. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to really do it locally. And therefore, kind of, we, because again, you have the problem locally what is the local neighborhood of the most strongest correlated locations? And kind of to select those, um, we just assume a spatial temporal anisotropy as a first guess, take a bit larger spatial temporal neighborhood of this kind of metric neighborhood calculate for all those points in this larger cube uh, the covariance values to the point I'd like to predict, and then we select the, as you provided, as you ask for the strongest correlated trend, 20, 50 points out of this larger cube. So kind of your actual neighborhood uh, might have a completely different structure and might not be a cube anymore uh, when you do the local spatial temporal prediction, because kind of we use the variogram model that you provide to the creating function to really select the most correlated values out of a larger uh, block. But it's, there is no easy way to define a metric that selects you those points immediately. So we have to do this workaround by selecting a larger uh, metric block cube and kind of calculate covariance for it and select the highest ones. Um, here are a few references. Uh, they are more in the uh, GSTAT package and in the GSTAT demo and vignettes where you could look at. So that's for the first sessions. Any more questions? And um, would you like to prefer hands on next or a block of more theory next? Who's, who's a hand for hands for? And theory, hmm, that's a problem. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Uh, so I, I suggest then we stick to the original schedule, having theory and then hands-on in the afternoon. Um, are these methods uh, dependent on, uh, on something the same uh, points in the field at each time step? Uh, no, they can be irregular spread, they can be missing values, and uh, yeah. 
So it's, it doesn't have to be the same locations every time. You can move them, you can have kind of events so that just occur at some point, and you can look at the dependence between events of very irregular time steps. It doesn't even have to be daily values. But then you have to provide, um, so if you provide a spatial temporal full data frame, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've been to Edsource class yesterday, um, if you have this full data frame structure, then we will assume that you have regular temporal measurements. Uh, and if you provide a sparse or an um, irregular data frame, then the routines and background are slightly different and really start to do some different binnings to really get all those different combinations of points that might occur. So it might depend on the data structure, what you provide to the function, what you get. So this, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I will upload them. Okay. They are not there yet, but I will do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Then see you after the coffee break.